Division of Energy Resources. And this webinar is one in an ongoing series designed to summarize the results from research projects funded by Minnesota's Applied Research and Development Fund. The Applied Research and Development Fund was established in the Next Generation Energy Act of 2007. Joe, could you forward my slide? Thanks. Its purpose is to help Minnesota utilities achieve their 1.5% energy savings goal by identifying new technologies or strategies to maximize energy savings, improving the effectiveness of energy conservation programs, and documenting CO2 reductions from energy conservation programs. 2.6 million of this fund is set aside annually for the CARD program, which awards research grants in a competitive request for proposal or RFP process. Since the legislation was enacted, the CARD program has had eight funding cycles with 22 RFPs posted, received nearly 380 proposals, and funded 92 research projects representing over 21 million in research dollars. As you can see by this pie chart, projects funded to date have been in all building sectors. The subject of today's webinar is a research project which quantified remaining T12 lighting fixtures in Minnesota's commercial building stock. It will be presented by Joe Plummer of Franklin Energy. All right, well, thank you everyone. And thanks, I just want to say thank you to the Department of Commerce for this opportunity. Uh, like Mary Sue said, I'm Joe Plummer. I'm an energy engineer with Franklin Energy based in our St. Paul office. And I'll be talking to you today about a study on fluorescent T12 lighting that we performed with card funding. You might ask, why are we doing this study on an old obsolete lighting technology like T12s? Didn't the phase, the, I'm sorry, didn't the feds phase this out? Well, it did, but that doesn't mean that this lighting is not still in use. But how big of a problem is it really from an energy use perspective? Well, it's hard to answer that question with only anecdotal information. So we put forth this study to provide some hard evidence of how much energy these fixtures are really using. And then how utilities can help replace these fixtures with more efficient technologies. With that said, here are the items I'll be covering today. First, I'll provide some additional background on the study, including the research object objectives and a history of commercial lighting standards. Next, I'll describe the study methodology. In other words, how we went about collecting and analyzing the data. Next, I'll cover the major findings from the study. I'll then outline some recommendations for how programs can identify and capture savings opportunities related to T12 lighting. The next to last section will be our recommendations for how the Minnesota Technical Reference Manual could be updated to support T12 conversions to LED. And finally, I'll wrap up with a summary of the uh, high level takeaways from this study that I think are most important. So, the background of this study. As we all know, T12s are an outdated, inefficient technology. Unfortunately, it lives on. The manufacture and import of this technology was phased out beginning in July of 2010. And just before that year and in the years after, utilities heavily promoted T12 changeouts through T8 bonus rebates and bounties on T12 fixtures. These, um, these efforts were fairly successful as demonstrated by the SIP filings through that period. Nonetheless, there was anecdotal evidence before this study that significant quantities of T12 remained in operation in Minnesota, a state with 30 years of DSM behind it. So with this evidence in mind, we put forth this study with the following research questions. What is the total T12 load remaining? What is the energy savings potential from changing out this load to more efficient fluorescent or LED technologies? And how can utilities target remaining T12s? So first, some background on the different technologies. T12s have been around since about the 1930s. Currently, their efficacy varies from about 55 to 70 lumens per watt. And I should mention these numbers on this slide are typical of a 48-inch linear bipin tube. 
uh, which is the most common type of tube that's out there today. Um, but back to T12s, they typically have a wattage for a four foot tube of 40 watts and a lifespan of 20,000 hours. In contrast, a T8 is much more efficient. It varies in efficacy from 89 to 96 lumens per watt. A typical wattage is going to be 32 watts, and its lifespan varies from 24,000 to 36,000 hours. And as we all know, right now, LEDs are at a cutting edge. Their efficacy is even higher, typically varying from about 110 lumens per watt all the way up to 150, and that upper range is increasing as we speak. A typical watt is for a four foot LED T8 tube is gonna vary between 15 to 18 watts. And it's gonna have a lifespan as, me as measured by the L70 metric of 50,000 hours. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with that term, the L70 metric re refers to the time at which the fixture has decreased to 70% of its initial light output. So that's not the time to failure, that's just the time um, at which the, the, light, uh, the light output has decreased by 30%. So as I mentioned before, T12s have, at this point, essentially been phased out by federal lighting standards. However, when I say phased out, what I'm referring to is the manufacturer import of T12 lamps and ballasts. It's still perfectly legal to sell these products, as I'll demonstrate in the next slide. So this uh, chart shows a slide uh, shows a timeline of federal lamp standards and ballast standards. On the top are the lamp standards, and on the bottom are the ballast standards. So beginning with lamps, the first standards were enacted in 1992. There was no further rulemaking done until 2009. When the, the, when the minimum efficacy for a four foot tube was set to the equivalent value of a series 800 T8. Now that uh, efficiency requirement didn't actually kick in until 2014, at least fully in effect. Switching gears to uh, the ballasts, and by the way, ballasts, for those of you who don't know, are the electric circuitry that's installed between the line voltage and uh, the tubes. And there's a ballast present in every fluorescent fixture that's out there. So the first uh, standards for ballasts were instated in 1990. At that point, um, what were known as standard magnetic ballasts were prohi prohibited. Any ballasts made after that date um, that I'm speaking of magnetic ballasts are referred to as energy savings or energy efficiency, energy efficient magnetic ballasts. In the year 2000, the ballast standards were again amended, um, and basically they set basically the standard, or I'm sorry, the magnetic ballasts for T12s were prohibited in 2005 in new in new T12 fixtures. And then in 2010, all T12 magnetic ballasts were prohibited, both in fixtures and as uh, standard units or standalone units. So again, when I'm saying prohibited, I'm referring to the manufacturer import, not the sale of these products. And in fact, say Joe, it's very yeah. Say Joe, you may want to switch your monitor. It's showing um, the. Um, the slides, the next slide, and the other. So you may want to switch it to just show your slide. Okay. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. No problem. Okay. Sorry about that, everyone. So, um, yeah, as I was saying, it's still very possible to purchase uh, T12s today. 
these are some online, these are the results of some online searches I did about a week ago. You can see that uh, standard four foot T12s are still for sale at um, all the different major home improvement um, stores that are out there, Lowe's, Home Depot, Menards, and Ace. Um, for Menards, I included a screenshot of a T12 ballast. Now this is actually an electronic T12 ballast, which um, are not prohibited by the current ballast standards. Um, electronic ballast is going to be a little bit more efficient than a magnetic ballast. So this just reiterates, I guess, that not only are T12 still in operation, but it's still possible to buy replacement parts for existing fixtures. All right, now I'd like to talk about the methodology behind the study. So this was a field study. Um, all the data that we collected was collected from site visits of actual businesses across the state. We used this approach as, as opposed to phone surveys, which probably would have been less costly, but um, are also probably less reliable. So we thought actually putting boots on the ground and sending people in the buildings to collect information was the most reliable method. We chose a cluster sample design um, to minimize the travel. And by that, I mean that the sites that we visited were clustered in um, 10 cities spread across the state. Uh, I guess a standard sample design would have just selected a number of uh, businesses just spread out across the state that were not necessarily clustered in cities. So that would obviously um, lead to a lot more drive time and gas consumption. So we chose a, a cluster sample design. Um, so we worked with a consultant, uh, Loom Advising, to help us with the um, experimental design of this study. And we ended up working on a uh, what's called a power analysis. And a power analysis basically looks at the margin of error um, across different uh, sample combinations. Our goal with this study was to produce results at a margin of error of no greater than 10% at 90% at confidence. So we worked with Illum to analyze different test cases. Um, from the initial analysis that we did, um, it was known that we needed a sample size of about 200, meaning 200 businesses, um, in order to get to this margin of error across the state. So we looked at different combinations of communities and businesses per community that would yield a sample size of 200. And you can see in test case four, there were 40 community, communities that would have been visited and five businesses per community. And as you go down in test cases, um, the number of communities drops and the number of businesses increases. But in all cases, there's a sample size of 200, or I guess one exception in test case two with 210. We also accounted for some correlation between T12s and community. Um, in other words, uh, there could be some relationship, uh, there could be some effect of the community on how many T12s are located in the community. For example, um, the effectiveness of the utility that serves that community in terms of their SIP program could play into how many T12s are there. If the utility isn't, um, doesn't, isn't investing much money in a commercial lighting program, um, it's probably gonna be more T12s because fewer fixtures have been changed out. Um, another effect might be that uh, if the community overall, its economic health is rather poor, then it's likely that the businesses have not been able to um, invest in new lighting, so you might expect to find uh, more T12s in those types of communities. So long story short, this design effect um, effectively decreases the sample size. So that was accounted for in the study. However, even with this effect, you can see from the far right column here that in all the test cases we looked at, um, the margin of error is no greater than 10%. We ended up choosing test case four, which corresponds to 10 communities and 20 businesses per community, because we felt this would best balance the goal of achieving a high level of precision with minimizing cost.
So for this study, uh, we used random sample draws, both of communities and businesses. For communities, uh, we divided the state into five regions and selected two communities per region. Now, this was not a purely random sampling. Um, what we did is we applied a method known as probability weighting according to size. And that basically compensated for the fact that small cities are much more numerous than large cities in Minnesota. If we had not done this, then the sample would have been heavily skewed towards small cities. As far as selecting businesses, we did use a random sample draw here. Um, however, we stratified the sample by size, um, size being the size of the business location in square feet. Small was up to 5,000 square feet. Medium was between 5,000 to 10,000 square feet. And large, we defined as 10,000 square feet or greater. The source of the business listings that we used for the sample was Sales Genie, which is a commercial marketing and sales database. This slide illustrates the regions across the state. As I mentioned, there's five different regions that we defined. There's the seven county metro, including Minneapolis and St. Paul, and then the southeast, southwest, northwest, and northeast. And the table to the right shows the communities that we selected through the sampling method I just described. Um, as you can see, there's a, quite a large um, range in size across the communities. Obviously, Minneapolis and St. Paul are by far the biggest. But um, in the remaining cities, their size ranged from as small as 243 for Foley in the Northwest up to uh, 7,204 for Duluth. So I think we had a pretty good um, sampling of cities across the state. And as well, we also had a pretty diverse mix of communities in terms of size. So the site assessments were largely a cold calling activity. Um, an energy advisor would show up at, at, at the location and ask for permission to um, count the lighting fixtures and, do, and collect other information. For some cities, at, at least in the um, initial part of the, the field collection phase, uh, we mailed postcards ahead of time to notify people that we, we would be stopping by for this study. However, as uh, time went on and we visited more cities, we found that um, in most cases, uh, or in many cases at least, uh, the people that were present in the business um, had not recalled actually receiving the postcard. I mean, they might not be the owner. Um, they might, maybe it is the owner, but the employee, or but the owner had not, just didn't remember receiving the postcard. And so we kind of stopped doing that because it didn't seem to be offering much benefit. Um, we initially offered uh, two free LED bulbs as well as an incentive for participating. This we also found didn't seem to have much impact, so we eventually stopped doing that. Um, the vast majority of businesses agreed to participate in the study. The ones that didn't generally had a privacy concern. I mean, they didn't want a third party walking through their um, their, their office. So you know, the LED bulbs were not going to help with that concern. We did carry an information sheet with us that um, described the study and offered assurances that the data collected uh, would only be used in aggregate. And it also had contact information for myself and Mark Garifano at the Department of Commerce. And we found that this information sheet was useful to um, improve the perceived credibility of the study. So the assessments were designed to be quick with minimal disruption to the customer. Generally, they could be completed in 15 minutes or less, except for the, the largest sites that we visited. Um, before we sent um, someone out to a given community, we pre-selected the sites that they would be visiting. And we would select 60 sites for a given city, 20 sites for each size category. Um, the end goal was to achieve 20 completions in that city but uh, we would select 60 so that there was a, basically a safety margin for people that didn't want to participate or uh, businesses that were closed or what have you. Um, each assessor was given a quota of six to seven buildings within each category, small, medium, and large. And like I said, a, a 
total of 20 for that community. So when we went on site, uh, this is a quick summary of what we captured. We captured T12 fixture counts, the wattages of the tubes, and the ballast type. Uh, we captured the ballast type using a, a ballast discriminator, which can detect um, an electronic ballast versus a magnetic ballast. I should mention that we did not find any T12 um, electronic ballasts out there. They were all magnetic, uh, which is kind of what we expected going into this. Uh, we also captured operating hours. That was based on conversations with um, an employee or the owner. Um, in some cases, it was based on the posted business hours of the location. So we didn't actually do any data logging, but um, we were able to get the hours through this, the, just through conversation or, like I say, the posted information. Uh, we also captured the air conditioning presence, whether or not the, the space was mechanically cooled, um, because that plays into the savings calculation. And we gathered other information, which um, has not been used directly for this study, but information on the building type, the dominant types of lighting that were present, um, information on the ownership of the business, be it an independent business or a uh, franchise or a chain. Um, we weren't able to use all this information in the study, but it could uh, prove useful down the road. Once we gathered all the site information, we wrote a visual basic program that compiled all the data into a single spreadsheet for analysis. And then we did some pretty heavy uh, quality control review on that um, to fill in missing information where we could, um, to look for outliers, things that were obviously um, typos and so forth. So uh, we went through the data pretty carefully and uh, made sure it was as accurate as possible. So once we had this uh, sample information, then the next step was to um, extrapolate to various statewide totals. Um, these totals included um, kilowatts, kilowatt hours, T12 prevalence, et cetera. And I'll go through some of the major findings in the following slides. Basically, this was done by computing um, an average across the sample for each um, region and size category, uh, multiplying by the number of buildings in that category and then summing the products. This process is probably best illustrated um, with the table. And within the report, if you're in from, if you're more, if you want some more detail, there's um, tables like this for for each major finding that's in the report. Um, this is an example of how the T12 energy consumption in gigawatt hours was computed. So um, so we have the five different regions across the state, and within each region, the buildings were um, divided between the small, medium, and large categories. So the, the second column is the number of um, completions within that category. The third column, the T12 kilowatt hours, is the total consumption of T12s within that category. The next column is the average kilowatt hours per site, uh, that's simply dividing the total T12 by the sample count. And then the next column is the population subset. That is the number of buildings across the state, um, or I'm sorry, in that uh, region and size category, according to the Sales Genie database. So we multiplied the average, in this case, average kilowatt hours per site, by the number of buildings in that category and that yielded the product on, in the far right column. And then we simply added together these products to get a statewide total. So I'd now like to go through um, the good stuff, the major findings from this study. So starting with the T12 prevalence, in other words, um, how common are T12s really? Well, in, in the 210 total buildings that we visited as part of the sample, uh, we found T12s in 56 of them, approximately one out of four. And it, if we follow the same procedure I just, you, I just described, um, statewide it also works about, out to about a one in four ratio. So about one in four non-residential buildings um, have at least 
one T12 fixture. And this doesn't say anything about how often that fixture is actually used, but um, we believe this ratio is accurate across the state that there's at least one T12 fixture um, in about one out of four non-residential buildings. That was actually a little bit higher than I thought it would be. We also looked at um, the size distribution of uh, T12 lamps. Um, we divided uh, the sizes into four foot, eight foot, and under four foot categories. And we found that four foot lamps were by far the most prevalent with 83%, uh, followed by eight foot lamps at 15%. Uh, we also looked at the number of lamps per fixture, and not too surprisingly, I guess, um, for four-foot lamps and eight-foot lamps, uh, most fixtures had um, either two or four lamps per fixture. The under four-foot uh, tubes, which were not very common, overwhelmingly just had one lamp per fixture. So we also looked at the total load across the state of T12s. And following the same basic procedure I uh, described previously, we arrived at a total load across the state of 242 megawatts. Now that sounds like a lot of energy, but we wanted some way to put that into context. So we looked at, we estimated what the total commercial and industrial lighting load is in Minnesota. And we did that using data from the Energy Information Administration, specifically the Form 861 data, which is data reported by utilities, and then the CBEX, or Commercial Building Energy Consumption Survey database of uh, commercial buildings across the country. So using that data, and the procedure is um, explained in detail in the report if you're interested, but we arrived at a total load across the state of 2,558 megawatts. So the T12 load is just under 10% of that total. As far as energy consumption, um, we estimated a total consumption of 881 gigawatt hours per year consumed by T12 fixtures. And um, underlying that, we found that the average operating hours of T12 fixtures was 3,226, approximately 60 hours per week. Again, this is another big number, 881 gigawatt hours. So to put that into perspective, we found that that's the equivalent consumption of approximately 77,000 U.S. homes. And to visualize that, those of you are, who are familiar with the metro area uh, of Minneapolis and St. Paul, um, this uh, screenshot here from Google Earth is showing um, the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul and then some of the surrounding suburbs. But I found that if you actually draw a box around uh, South Minneapolis, which is where I live, um, that box equates to about 20 square miles. And within that box, uh, there's about 77,000 homes. So um, this, is this, I got, this is an illustration, I guess, of what uh, 77,000 homes looks like, at least at least in an urban setting. So uh, one other finding is the technical savings potential. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, one of the goals of the study was to um, estimate the energy savings potential from upgrading the T12s to more efficient fixtures. And just looking at the best available LED technologies that are on the DLC qualified products list, we found that 63% uh, savings could be achieved. Um, and that's, the, uh, that's a technical savings potential. That's ignoring you know, the cost effectiveness or the payback to the customer. It's just if every fixture was replaced with the most efficient lighting technology that was out there, this is how many um, gigawatt hours could be saved. This is actually somewhat of a conservative estimate though, however, because um, we used a lumen equivalent analysis. In other words, 
um, we compared the current light output of T12s to, and then kept that lumen output constant and looking at what the wattage would be with an LED. In reality, when people switch to LEDs, the, the lumen output is generally decreased, and that's because LEDs tend to be more directional, so they don't put off as much total light, but since the light is more directional, you don't actually need as much lumen output. So 63% is a, a good savings estimate, but it's probably also somewhat conservative. One very important finding that we found was the, that uh, small buildings, those that are square, uh, 5,000 square feet or under, have the highest T12 power density. By power density, I mean watts per square foot. So just looking at this table here, you can see that um, the small category statewide has the most buildings. Um, the total T12 load is not the highest in this category, but if you look at the watts per square foot, it's the highest by quite a bit, 0.284, as opposed to 0.116 for medium buildings and 0.043 for large buildings. And uh, I should say that this finding was um, it basically conformed to expectations. We, we knew through, through our own work that um, T12s tended to be most prevalent in small businesses. So um, I guess that observation was supported by this finding. So based on all this information, how can utilities best work with their customers to upgrade their T12 fixtures? Well, the first decision that has to be made is uh, what kind of fixtures should be installed. Um, when we did this report, we initially set out to include fluorescence with LEDs as replacement options. However, um, it became apparent that as we were doing, doing the analysis that there wasn't really, I guess, a whole lot of value derived from looking at fluorescent replacements um, for a number of reasons, but uh, the most important being that most customers that we talk to today are not interested in going to fluorescent T8s. They want to go to LEDs. I think everyone knows that LEDs are um, the cutting edge technology and the most efficient technology right now. So um, in our experience, people aren't really too interested in a T12 to T8 conversion anymore. A few years ago, um, just two to three years ago, I mean, LEDs were still pretty rare in the marketplace and a T12 to T8 conversion was by far the most common. So that was because the cost of LEDs at that time was quite high and the efficiency wasn't really that great. But both of those um, parameters have improved greatly just over the last few years to the point now that um, LEDs really are, are pretty much on every, every business's radar as far as um, the next technology to convert to. So focusing on LEDs, um, there's three basic product categories that can serve as replacement options for T12s. There's LED T8 tubes, there's LED retrofit kits, and LED luminaires. From a cost perspective, obviously every project varies, but roughly speaking, the cost increases in going from um, LEDs through kits through luminaires. From an efficiency standpoint, uh, LED T8s, they're, they're very efficient, but ultimately the lumens per watt coming out of the fixture is going to depend on the optics within that fixture, the lens cover, any louvers, et cetera. Um, from a very high level, I would say that LED kits and LED luminaires are approximately equal in terms of luminaire efficiency, and this is borne out by the Design Lights Consortium data. Um, but if money is no object, I think you know a, a new LED luminar, luminaire is going to be the best replacement object for a business. It's going to offer um, optimal light distribution. It's going to give the light fixture is a new look aesthetically. Um, like I say, it's, it's the best option if money's no object. That's not true of most businesses though. 
Um, in that case, like LED kits are a very good option for many businesses, um, as well as uh, LED TAs. Whatever option is chosen, we recommend that programs promote or require uh, Design Lights Consortium listed LED products. The DLC um, listing is sort of like Energy Star for residential bulbs. Um, DLC products have been tested by independent uh, laboratories and they have to meet certain requirements including efficiency and reliability. So um, probably most people know this, but DLC products are generally recommended for commercial lighting programs. Um, before I go on, I just wanted to mention, um, I wanted to discuss the different types of LED TAs that are out there. There's three basic types, um, although only two are shown here. The first type is a UL type A, which are sometimes referred to as plug and play. They're tubes that do not have an integrated driver, um, and they're designed to work off an existing fluorescent T8 ballast. And since they're designed to work with a T8 ballast, I didn't include them as a T12 replacement option. There's also the type B tubes. Um, the type B tubes have an integrated ballast and they're designed to receive, to receive line voltage directly. So with the type B installation, an electrician is needed to rewire the fixture to um, electrically remove the existing ballast from the circuit. And then a type C are tubes that do not have an integrated driver. Rather, the driver is remote um, product somewhat akin to a fluorescent ballast. Type Cs um, offer the most flexibility in terms of controllability, um, in terms of dimming and communication with building automation systems and so forth. However, they're also the most expensive. So, I mean, we don't see a whole lot of type C's going in today, but that might change down the road. I wanted to touch on some safety concerns surrounding type B since I think it's very important to be aware of these if programs are gonna promote or rebate type B LED tubes. Again, the, the type B are the direct wire in which line voltage is wired directly to the sockets. There are some safety concerns that um, arise as a result. One is um, the risk of an electrical shock for the installer while they're on a ladder inserting the tubes. For example, if um, one of their hands gets too close to the socket while they're inserting the tube and you, you touch the two terminals, you could potentially receive a jolt of line voltage, um, which is obviously not good if you're standing on a ladder. Well, it's not good at any time, I guess, but especially bad if you're on a ladder. Um, the second concern has to do with the sockets. Uh, most existing sockets are not going to be compatible with line voltage. Um, if there is line voltage applied to them, the electrical insulation can degrade over time and eventually cause a short. So what's needed are type B compatible sockets, which are often sold with the tubes themselves. So it's just something that people should be aware of. A third concern has to do with the socket type. There's two basic types, shunted versus non-shunted. Type B tubes require non-shunted sockets, which are also used by T12, so that's kind of handy, I guess. The risk is if you have a facility with a mixed mixture of T12 and T8 fixtures, because some, um, some T8 fixtures can use uh, shunted ballast, specifically the kind, or shunted sockets, I'm sorry, specifically the kind with instant start ballasts. And it's not always possible to, possible to determine the type of sh shunting just visually. It really has to be done with an electrical meter. This slide illustrates the three different types of, or the two different types of sockets. On the far left, there's a non-shunted socket. So there's no wire present between the terminals on the bottom. So it definitely looks like it's non-shunted. In the middle is an example of a shunted socket. You can see the wire connecting the terminals, which is sometimes referred to as the pigtail. On the third though is an example of a shunted socket where the shunting is internal. It's not visible. So like I say, the only way to verify for sure what kind of socket you have is to, to electrically test it. This is something that many electricians are gonna know, but 
Um, many maintenance staff may not be aware of this. The final concern around type B tubes has to do with mixed tube types, adding fluorescent and LED tubes in the same facility. The risk is that if a fluorescent tube is inserted in a sock in a fixture that's wired for a type B tube, that um, the fluorescent lamp would explode. So that's obviously not good. Um, the best practice to avoid this situation is to retrofit the entire facility and remove all fluorescent lamps from the premises. However, there's even there's always some risk that I guess a person who's not knowledgeable about LED technologies would inadvertently um, insert a fluorescent tube in uh, a, in a fixture wired to line voltage. There's a greater risk with some third-party maintenance crews, again, people who aren't very experienced with LEDs, or with volunteer maintenance staff, as um, commonly found in churches or synagogues. So that said, um, I think a good way to think about this is that all LED options should be on the table. It's not really a one-size-fits-all solution. The concerns around type B tubes can be mitigated by working with an experienced electrician. DSM programs can play an important role by helping to identify and quantify cost-effective replacement options based on the unique needs of each customer. Once a customer gets to the point that they want to move forward with a project, they should work with an experienced supplier to make sure they're selecting a quality product and one that's one that's one that is going to be compatible with its fixtures. As far as programmatic approaches, the fact that um, the highest concentration of T12s is found in small businesses suggests that the sort of older mass market rebate-based approach isn't necessarily going to work anymore. In the past, utilities did achieve success with this type of approach through bonus offers for T8s as well as bounties on T12 replacements. Going forward, we think higher touch approaches may be needed for the remaining T12s. One, one way of uh, doing this is to um, use what we call a small business split, coupled with a T12 bonus offer. We define a small business split as when teams of utility representatives canvass a community to perform quick energy assessments in small businesses, zero, zero, zeroing in on the top three to four opportunities. There's a lot of, there's customer interaction that can happen, um, which is also valuable because the um, energy assessor can provide ed education on energy efficiency measures as well as the utility offerings that are available. Following the site visit, a brief report can be provided detailing the opportunities and the expected paybacks. A second method is to leverage trade allies. Small businesses often have long-standing trusted relationships with the local contractors and rely on their expertise when uh, choosing to upgrade their facility. So to the extent that uh, utility can leverage these trade allies as an adjunct sales force, uh, good things can happen. However, this requires trusted allies as well as outreach and education to, to educate the trade allies on the program offerings. So it's not necessarily easy. Minnesota Power did have success with this approach in International Falls. They knew from previous energy audits in the area that there was a very high concentration of T12 fixtures in the, in the city. So they worked with um, local trade allies and they set up uh, an incentive program where the contractors could earn $10 per T12 changeout for installing an LED fixture in place of the T12. And they had pretty good success with this um, approach. So if a utility is going to tackle T12, it's important to think about what kind of rebates might be needed. Unfortunately, based on the numbers that we've looked at, it looks like existing rebates may not be sufficient for many customers to choose to upgrade their working T12 fixtures. 
So I put together an example of an LED tube um, project. This customer has two lamp 40 watt T12 fixtures throughout its fixture, throughout its facility. It operates 45 hours a week, which we have found is very common for a small business. And let's say that the energy auditor has recommended type B LED tubes, the direct wire type, um, at a wattage of 18 watts and a cost of $15 per tube. And these are not the plug and play type, so there's gonna be an electrical contractor involved. And they have a bill, uh, billable rate of $100 per hour, which is fairly typical. The time to install the tubes per fixture is uh, 15 minutes, which we feel is uh, uh, an educated guess. And let's say the business has a rate of 10 cents per kilowatt hour, including demand charges and so forth, which is also fairly typical in Minnesota. The savings of, these project, of this project is going to be about 120 kilowatt hours per year, or, or about $12 per fixture. So if you look at the payback chart on the left, you can see with that with a current rebate of about $5 per tube, which is typical of the levels offered in Minnesota, uh, the payback is almost four years. So that's, that's not a bad payback, but it's going to be too high for a lot of small businesses. Many businesses are going to want a payback of two years or even one year or less to be able to move forward with the project. So to get to that level, there'd have to be a total rebate of about $15 per lamp. So that means a $10 bonus rebate would be offered on top of the existing $5 rebate. So looking at LED retrofit kits, um, in this example, the, the total wattage of the fixture is gonna be the same at 36 watts. And I have the same parameters as far as labor rates and. Um, I guess a slightly different installation time, 10 minutes per fixture for the kit. The savings is the same, 120 kilowatt hours per year. But since kits tend to be, on average, more expensive than, than tubes, um, this example shows a much uh, longer payback, unfortunately. Currently in Minnesota, um, rebates for LED kits vary by wattage. For 36 watts, the typical level might be $30. But you can see from the chart here that the payback um, at this level is only about seven years. To get down to that two-year payback level, it would have to be increased up to $90. So that means a bonus rebate of $60 per kit. Now, again, I want to emphasize that this is a um, early replacement situation. This is replacement of um, working T12 tubes. Once the uh, fixtures start to fail because of most commonly probably ballast failures, um, and businesses see that it's going to be rather expensive to replace the ballast, then the calculus is going to change. They're going to be looking at um, perhaps LED options compared to T8s. But in, in order to get customers to move to replace their working T12 fixtures, in many cases there are going to have to be high rebates involved. But the rebate, of course, isn't the whole story. Customers want to change out their lighting for a variety of reasons. I mean, one could just be aesthetics. The other could be to improve the lighting quality. Um, say it's a manufacturing shop and they, they have very dim lighting currently with very poor color rendering. So they may, they may want to upgrade to LED and get a better lighting quality, even if it means a longer payback. So it's important when energy auditors are talking to customers that they emphasize these non-energy benefits of LEDs as well. One other idea we discussed in the report is a utility bulk purchase. One barrier for small businesses is that they don't, um, they can't access the favorable volumetric pricing discounts that a large business can. So one way around this might be for the utility to purchase LED products on behalf of its small business customers. Now there's gonna be some risk in this, of course, even, even if the utility can arrive at an accurate Count of the T12 fixtures in its territory, there's always a risk that um, customers are not going to choose to um, upgrade to LEDs even after the bulk purchase is made. 
This can be mitigated by obtaining a letter of commitment from, for, from customers that want to participate, or perhaps an upfront monetary contribution towards the cost of the product. As far as sourcing the product, um, there could be an RFP for local suppliers, or they could be purchased through an implementation partner such as Franklin Energy. So I'm almost done here, but I wanted to briefly discuss some recommendations um, that are specific to the Minnesota Technical Reference Manual. So we feel that based on the, the findings from this study, which found that LEDs are still a significant, or I'm sorry, T12s are still a, a significant source of uh, power consumption in Minnesota, that there is um, justification for supporting T12 to LED conversions um, in the TRM. Currently, there's a T12 to T8 and a T12 to T5 measure in the Minnesota TRM, but there's no direct T12 to LED. We feel that adding it to the TRM would help um, would help uh, provide an impetus for utilities to um, go out and convert remaining T12s in their territory. There is one uh, parameter associated with the measure, though, that is kind of tricky, and that's the measure lifetime. Right now in the TRM, there's a deemed lifetime of one year for T12 to T8 conversions. This is based on two different factors. One is the estimated remaining useful life of the T12 ballots that are in operation. And the other factor is the fact that federal standards have made a T8 the standard replacement option. So the assumption is that once the T12 ballots fail, that the customer would go with a T8 anyways, because that's the only option available. Choosing the measure lifetime really comes down to the question, how much longer will the T12 ballots last? Fortunately, that's not easy to answer. I think Yogi Berra said it best when he said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. How long a T12 ballot is gonna last is dependent on the operating hours, how frequently it's turned on and off, variations in the manufacturing quality, and probably other factors as well. The fact is that many will continue operating for years to come. And it's also worth noting that um, new T12 lamps and ballast uh, parts can still be purchased at this time. So there is cause to believe that some, of, some T12 fixtures are gonna continue operating for some time to come. So one approach we recommend in the uh, report is for the DLC to consider a one-year measure of lifetime for T12 to LED conversions. Um, basically what this chart shows is the utility would claim the full savings in going from a T12 to an LED, but only over a one-year life. And this, this would essentially, this is kind of a conservative approach in that it ignores the savings that occur in years two through 15, but allows the full savings to be claimed over a one-year period. All right, well, that's all I had. Um, just wanted to wrap up with some high-level conclusions. So as we showed, there's a significant stock of T12s remaining in Minnesota, and this is a state with 30 years of DSM. The actual percentage of T12s in other states could be much higher, states with less history of DSM. These fixtures consume an equivalent energy consumption of 77,000 U.S. homes. We found that the highest power density is in um, small businesses, and this plays into how programs should tackle the remaining T12s in their territories. Some suggested program approaches we discussed are small business blitzes combined with T12 bonus offers or LED buy-downs, or trade ally incentives for T12 upgrades. So I thank you for your time, and at this point, I'll take any questions, and my contact information is uh, noted below. Let's see, I have to unmute Mary Sue here. I've, I've mute, unmuted myself, so thanks, Joe. Okay. Uh, I don't have any questions right now in the docket. We do have a couple of minutes. If anybody does have a question and wants to type it in quickly, Joe will answer it. Um, 
currently there's no questions, but send one in. Or if you think of a question after um, the webinar is over, I'm sure that if you email Joe at this address he's got showing here on the slide, he'd be happy to answer the question directly. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, here's one question. Are there any T12 LED replacement lamps that work with magnetic ballast that you're aware of? This yeah, there's, well, there's at least one product that claims to be um, compatible with the T12 magnetic ballast. However, there's one caveat to that. Um, it, it, the product literature says that the starter circuit within the ballast would have to be removed. So we haven't actually tested this product yet, to my knowledge. Uh, I know we were working with CERTs to um, do some testing on that. Um, but from a practical standpoint, I guess I would question, I guess, the uh, wisdom of um, keeping the existing ballast in, in place and putting it in, in, in an LED um, just because that you don't really know how long that ballast is going to last. And then the fact that you have to physically modify the ballast makes it really pretty impractical to really consider. So I wouldn't recommend um, going with that solution even if it, if it does work. Okay, and then another question, would a $5 rebate um, be reasonable for a type A plug and play LED replacement lamp and would that payback be closer to two years? Yeah, I guess if you were gonna go with type A's, then um, the installation would be essentially like a type C in that you would have to install in a, a T8 electronic ballast in the fixture. So that ballast, um, I guess I'm not sure how much they cost as a standalone product, maybe 30 to $40. And there's gonna have to be some labor to install that as well. I, I think that you'd still be looking at a pretty long payback. Also the electronic ballast, it's probably not gonna have the same lifetime as an LED driver. Um, generally we say ballasts have a lifetime of eight to 10 years. So um, I think a better solution might be, again, to go with a type B or a type C LED tube. Okay, um, here's another question. Is there any consideration to recommend a multiple year savings for the Minnesota TRM? Yeah, I, I think that's something we could discuss. I know I've talked about TRM modifications with Mark Garofano at the DOC a little bit, and I think we're gonna have some discussions through the TRM advisory committee on this, so that could certainly be, be brought up. I guess I, I like the solution we presented because it's, it's just very simple. Um, it doesn't get into multiple baselines or you know estimating what the actual lifetime would be. It just kind of keeps the existing lifetime that's there for T12 to T8 retrofits and then allows a full year of savings um, calculation, um, but just for a one year lifetime. But yeah, that's not set in stone by any means. Okay, great. That's all the questions we've got right now, but if you do think of something else you wanna ask Joe, um, send it to him, email it to him, and he'll be happy to answer it. So um, why don't we wrap up then? So thanks for attending the CARD webinar. Um, you can download the final report on this project from the direct link on this slide, and the slides will be sent out to you afterwards. Um, the link for the CARD webpage is also on this slide. The web page contains various resources and information that are related to the CARD program and to CARD research projects, including links to this and other recorded CARD webinars and to final reports. You can use the quick links that are indicated on this slide to help you navigate to what you're looking for. So thanks again for participating in today's um, webinar. Um, before we leave, I wanna take an opportunity to mention a few upcoming CARD webinars that also might be of interest to you. On um, June 14th, um, we'll have a webinar on um, reducing 
envelope leakage in multifamily buildings using aerosol sealant, and that'll be presented by the Center for Energy and Environment. On the 22nd of June, CE will also conduct a webinar on improving the effectiveness of commercial energy recovery ventilation systems. And on July 12th, the Center for Energy and uh, the Wisconsin Energy Conservation Corp Corporation will conduct a webinar on small embedded data center program pilots. So please contact me if you want more information on how to sign up for any of these webinars or if you have questions or feedback on the CARD program or contact Joe if you've got questions or Mark Garifano who was the um, project manager on this project um, on, um, on anything on the T12 um, study. Thanks for attending.